Hey everyone, welcome to Group Text. As I am sure you're all aware, the headlines out of the entertainment industry have been consumed by the ongoing strikes by both the Writers Guild and the Screen Actors Guild over a variety of issues including pay increases, streaming residuals, and setting boundaries with the emergence of artificial intelligence technology in film and TV. Here to give us a thorough breakdown of all things strike-related is Variety's chief correspondent, Elizabeth Wagmeister. Elizabeth's bona fides on the subject of the entertainment industry are, let's use a big word, exemplary. She was the premier reporter covering news concerning Harvey Weinstein, the Kardashians, Colton Underwood, and the conservatorship of Britney Spears, just to name a few. Named one of Forbes magazine's 30 Under 30 in 2019, she also won the National Arts and Entertainment Journalism Award for Best Anchor and Host in the year 2020 and was twice nominated for Journalist of the Year. Let's just get right into it. Welcome, Elizabeth. That's like a lot. You you made me sound pretty good. I don't know if uh, if I could say the same, but thank you. And I am such a huge fan of yours and i am so excited to be chatting with you today on your podcast oh well thank you so before we begin so listeners are aware let me explain why i can still do my podcast even though i'm sag aftra i'm allowed to write and appear on this nonfiction podcast now tell me if i've got this right but if i wanted to promote my podcast on let's say another podcast the rules of the strike would preclude me from doing so. So it's all very meta. We need your help. You're the entertainment reporter who's been out talking to writers and actors on the picket line. So give us a primer for those that don't understand. We need the 101 class on what the hell is going on and how it will affect me. Okay, so to put this into perspective, first of all, this has not happened for over 60 years. The last time that the actors and the writers were on strike together, Ronald Reagan was the president of SAC. So we have not experienced anything like this. There is nobody who is covering the business today, who is working in the business today, who has dealt with this before. When the writers and the actors are both on strike, that essentially means that no work can be done in Hollywood. So all of production is shut down. And with all production shut down, in layman's terms, that means that your favorite TV shows and your favorite movies are not being filmed. Now, I'm glad that you mentioned why you can do your podcast because this impacts a lot more people than just actors and writers. There are a lot of people in the entertainment industry who are SAG members, such as influencers, such as TV personalities, they can't do a lot of their work. And then, of course, there's so many ancillary businesses that are impacted by this. So even if you're not a writer or actor on strike, let's talk about a production in Hollywood. There's caterers, there's drivers, all of those different businesses are impacted as well. So I know, Melissa, we're going to get way into this, but that's really a bit of a precursor for what this all is. And we could also, of course, get into why the actors and writers are on strike. But bottom line is, is they feel they are not being paid enough. They want residuals and they want protections in this streaming era with all of this emerging technology. Okay, but podcasters can do their podcasts. News shows can continue New, uh, and documentaries and docu-series can continue to film where so all your favorite reality shows your news broadcasts your podcasts your youtube shows can all continue yes. what about your entertainment news shows that are written like your entertainment tonight or your access hollywood so those are continuing right now and i can't speak specifically to each one of those shows but the bottom line is is if there is not a WGA writer, which is Writers Guild of America, on the show, or if it's not a SAG production, then it can continue. So, for instance, if you look at a show like The View, right, that show has been continuing because their writing staff is not made up of 
WGA members. I believe that they had a few and those people are not working right now, but that's why that show can continue. But then if you look at a Jimmy Fallon, that show's not continuing because his writers are all WGA, so they're not able to work. So the shows that you still see on the air with new episodes and not repeats, it means that it's not a SAG production. It's not a WGA production. That's why it can continue. And the same thing with podcasters or YouTubers. Many of them aren't SAG members, but someone like you, Melissa, who is, you're not on a SAG production acting right now. You are on your own podcast that is not a SAG production. And as you said, you're not promoting your project. So the rules are a bit, there's a lot of gray area there. And that's why there's so many questions. Mm -hmm. But if I am Margot Robbie right now, I cannot do an interview about Barbie because the actors are on strike. But I could do an interview to talk about the strike or I could do an interview to talk about my dog or my favorite color. So it's not that they can't do interviews. It's that they can't do interviews to promote projects that are impacted by this Hollywood strike. So on a show like, let's just say, the Kardashians, who are all SAG after, I am sure, they can't do press promoting the, their show. Well, so I again, I can't speak to that specific one because I'm not sure of the unions involved with that one, but I would assume that that is correct. And that's why if you've heard people say that the last strike, which was in 2007, 2008, that it was kind of the birth of reality TV. You've heard a lot of people say that Trump became Trump because of the last writer strike, because that's when The Apprentice really became very popular. If you've heard people say that, the reason why is because reality TV is now what all of these networks are going to rely on because they can't produce any scripted shows. So ABC was actually the first to do this. They saw that the writer strike was starting. They sent out their fall schedule. And if you look at their fall schedule, there's two Bachelor shows. There's Bachelor in Paradise and The Golden Bachelor, which is the Senior Citizen Bachelor show, which I personally can't wait for. Oh, can't wait. Right? I, that's a whole nother podcast. I'll have to come back to talk yes. about that. Yes. Can't uh, wait. Then you have Dancing with the Stars, and they do have reruns of Abbott Elementary, which is one of their most acclaimed comedies. Now, the other networks, just this week, actually, they after the, the actors went on strike, in addition to the writers, they announced their schedule. So NBC and CBS doing similar things. So reality shows can continue because they're not SAG productions. They're not WGA productions. And that's why this fall you're going to see a lot more reality TV. I feel like the, the executives at these networks and studios really didn't think this was going to happen. I have a good friend that works at Netflix, and when the Writers Guild went on strike, the first story was it's going to be 100 days, which would take us to August, which is really when everybody goes back to work. And they already had things teed up to start filming in August. Do you think that the writers will go back to work after this 100-day mark? Or do you think, we're really in this now for the long haul. I think we're in it for the long haul. Now, of course, anything can change overnight. But as of now, what I know, based on my reporting, based on being out there on the picket lines reporting, is they have not gone back to the table since the beginning of May. So since the writer strikes started, there have been no further discussions, period. So... There's no indication that this is ending anytime soon because there hasn't been any further discussions, any further negotiations. Now, what's interesting is now with the actors on strike, this is why we have this full Hollywood stop down. There is one school of thought that says there's power in numbers, right? Now that there's all these people, all the actors, all the writers really banding together, standing in solidarity with each other, they can't work. That does put pressure on the studios and the networks and all of these executives because they can't make money if they're not making content. And on the other hand, it also costs them a lot of money to deal with this strike. For instance, the the movie Gladiator right now is filming its, its latest um, with Paul Mezcal. And that was shut down. Also, Deadpool 3 with Ryan Reynolds was just shut down. Well, in our cover story this week, uh, Variety, our cover story is all about the strike. We have an executive who estimates that it costs $600,000 
to keep one of these productions open per day. So when you have one of these productions up and it has the set and it has all the costumes, that costs a lot of money. So from the actors and the writer's side, they're saying, we're willing to not work and to not make money during the strike because we want to set ourselves up better for the future. From the executive side, from the studio and network side, they're saying, yes, this is costing us a lot of money, but we don't want to make this deal because from their perspective, it doesn't benefit us financially to give the writers and actors more. But at a certain point, when does it become too much, right? When are they spending too money, too much money and losing too much money throughout this strike? Okay, so let's just briefly break down the two different strikes. The writer's strike is, and, I'm, and not in the weeds or the minutia, basically are about two, three different things. One, that the writers, as usual, are not being paid enough. When a write, You always talk about when a writer's on a hit show, they're quote-unquote made for life because you assume it's going to go into syndication and what a lot of people don't know is that when you're on a show like that and it goes into syndication or there's residuals, the writers will still make money. So with the, all the streaming, no one's figured out yet how to calculate what would then be residuals and the fact that it's up in perpetuity, that changes the, the financial picture and the writers are saying we can be replaced by AI, that you can keep a skeleton staff to take AI and just rewrite that. And they're pushing for obviously more money in general, but that these producers have found a loophole where they can operate with many fewer people in the writer's room, which is usually where all of this gets generated and just keep paying people for one-offs. Is that the basics of it? Yes, that's the basics. And, you know, to add to that, I think an easy way to understand it is if you look at the the broadcast TV model, right? So if you look at a show like Grey's Anatomy or NCIS, all of these shows back in the day, you know, they were running for over 20 episodes per season. The show kept going and going and going for, you know, 20 plus seasons or at least 10 plus seasons. And these writers had that job. They knew that they were showing up to work every day. It's the closest thing to a nine to five. You work with the same people. You sit in the writer's room. You go to set. Well, now when you look at the TV model, there is obviously so much more than broadcast television. So with streaming, a lot of these shows are only eight to 10 episodes and they might only last one season. So what all of these companies are doing is instead of staffing a writer's room, with writers who know that they're coming to work every day for years on end is they have these what are called mini rooms, which is less writers who come on and it's basically a gig economy. You have this show, you'll work on it for eight to 10 episodes and then you're done. So you don't know what your next job is year to year or even month to month. And they can't calculate, they haven't figured out how to calculate residuals and all that with streaming because no one knows how to, to truly track that. Everyone says all, when people come up with these numbers and this many people and that many people watched, that's all sort of still in the, we're not quite sure how to figure this out. So, and, 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 and we know, which is like um, the original rise of cable. Right. And then of DVR. And eventually we started getting numbers with DVRs that you got your live number you got your plus one, so within one day, and your plus three. And we just all figured that out. Yes. And then streaming. So here's the thing. There is a way to track the viewership, and all of the streamers know how to do it. They don't want to do it. And that has been a part of the streaming model since streamers came out. You'll notice that when there's a good story to tell then all of a sudden the numbers are out there. And if it's not the specific numbers, it is, you know, this is Netflix's highest watched show in English or whatever the metric might be. So when I was on the picket lines last week talking to the actors and both the actors and the writers are fighting for residual pay in this streaming era, they're all saying there is the technology to do this and all the companies know that. And that's why we are not stepping down on this because you know how to do it. 
So we want a piece of that pie. Now, the other thing is, is it's not hard to tell when something is successful, right? We all know that Stranger Things is watched by a gazillion people. You can see the impact in pop culture and on social media. So bottom line is, is both of these writers and actors are saying, we know that this show is successful and it wouldn't be successful without us. So while this show is making you hundreds of millions of dollars, we want a small piece of that pie. And from the writers and actors that I have interviewed, they've said, we're not asking for much. And what we're asking for is very, very reasonable. Obviously, the studio side feels differently. We saw Bob Iger's interview where he said what the actors are asking for is unrealistic. So this is really a tale of two stories. And the actors and writers and the studios couldn't be further away in what they expect and what they're fighting for. Uh, Bob Iger is the chairman of Disney. And I personally found that his comments were not a good look. Not a good look when you're at the Allen and Company Summit in Aspen with a bunch of other billionaire CEOs. Okay, let's let's pivot to the actors. Because one of the big things with actors is the use of AI and the use of their likeness without their consent. There was a story out there about a background actor that one day got a call and one of his friends was like, I didn't know you did this video game. And he was like, what? Because what they don't realize is they're signing away their likeness. Right. And that's a big sticking point. How is... This is a two-parter. How is that resolved now? And is technology moving so fast that we just need to keep going into these one or two-year contract deals because no one knows where it's going and no one can keep up? Right. And, you know, one of the strikes in the past revolved around DVDs and those sales. And, you know, when everything went to at-home entertainment. So we do see technology become a huge point of contention in these strikes and in these negotiations. But when it comes to AI, this is very scary to many actors who are working. So when I was interviewing them on the picket lines, I asked about there was a report that said that a background actor, which is the term for an extra, which is how we all know of um, background actors, is that they show up to set, they're paid the SAG rate, which is around $200 per day. And their face is scanned and then their face can be used until the end of time, which if that is true, that would mean that a background actor is making $200 or around there pre-tax and then they never work, but their face keeps being used. So that's obviously a very scary prospect. Now, the studio side is really pushing back on that and they are saying it's not till the end of time, it's just for that project. But still, what if you have a show that ends up being a huge success. And even if it's just for that project, their face can still continue to be used time and time again. So when I interviewed the actors, and I also spoke to Duncan Crabtree Ireland, who he is the chief negotiator for SAG-AFTRA, for the union that is representing the actors, he said to me, this is 100% true. This is exactly what they want to do. And an actor should be paid for every day and every second that they are on that set. It shouldn't be, here's essentially a scan of my face and and I never have to work again. So that is one of the major, three major issues that the actors are really pushing back on. And you can understand why. What are the other two major issues with the actors? The other two major issues are residuals which we already touched on, they have a very similar school of thought to the writers, which is they want a cut of the success from these streamers. And the other thing is higher pay. They want their day rates to be increased. They say that SAG, uh, per the last SAG contract, that they have not gotten a raise for these minimum daily rates in years and the cost of living has gone up, so they want their pay to go up so they can afford to live. And I think a major point that's coming out of this, which I think is really important to hit on, especially for people at home who aren't you know, in this business and don't understand exactly what is going on day to day, is you hear of an actor and you think the glitz and the glam and 
you know, you make a lot of money and you're traveling on private planes and you're getting your hair and makeup done. That's really only true for the 0.01% of the 0.01%. Sure, if you're Jennifer Aniston, you don't need to be on strike. But the reason we see these big name actors striking is because they want to stand in solidarity with their fellow actors. It's not just extras who can't pay their rent and who are really getting by paycheck to paycheck and working three jobs. It can be actors who are series regulars, people who you see on TV all the time. They still don't have enough money, they say, to be able to afford their livelihood. So the far majority of actors, they're lucky if they're making $30,000 per year. If you're making $30,000 per year, that means that you are a working actor who's actually getting work. You're not just sit- sitting there in that audition room. So I think that that is an important thing to bring up is that this isn't I, I've seen stuff on social media that says millionaires out there on strike. It's really not. This is a very tough industry. And these contracts, they put you in between a rock and a hard place, because if you're an actor who comes to L.A. from a small town and you're hoping to make it, you find you have an audition. It's probably your hundredth hundredth audition. Uh, if you're lucky and you finally get that role and you're excited, you're going to sign that contract. But what they're saying is these contracts are totally unfair and that they can't live on them. Well, and what people don't know about behind the scenes is like someone, an unknown or anyone who's starting a series, they put you in a seven year contract. Right. With very small increases. Again, you go back to that the studios and the producers, it's it's the producers union, which isn't really a union that are kind of being, are the bad guys. So he, a lot, okay, and this is, again, people don't realize this. Major stars and major actors are also producers on their projects. And you might hear about them making $10 million for the acting. What people don't realize is they're making more on what we call the back end as a producer, so you have people suddenly having to, they're, they're almost negotiating against themselves. How are they rectifying that? So you've got one foot with the good guys and one foot with the bad guys because both help you. Right. So I think right now what we're seeing is the big name writers and actors they're all standing with your with their union. They are standing with the WGA. They are standing with SAG-AFTRA. That's what we are seeing. And again, when we talk about who this really, why this matters and who this really pertains to, it's not those actors and it's not those writers. You know, if you're someone who's making $10 million per project, you don't need to be on strike for yourself, right? You're striking for For the other people. But I think, you know, something that's also interesting to point out is it's a very strange thing when you're in the same union and one person could be making $100 per week and another person is making $100 million per year. No other union has this huge range of pay. Unions usually have a range of pay where people are making somewhat in, in, in the same ballpark, right? But Hollywood is a business where it's high risk and high reward. And that's the reason why a lot of people go into this. They're artists and they're hoping to work. But nobody said that this business is easy. It is one of the toughest businesses in the world to even break into, let alone to sustain it. So what we're hearing from the studio side, not on the record, but if you talk to people on on that side, uh, or as you say, you know, kind of being portrayed perhaps as the bad guys, they're saying nobody forced you to come into this business. You know, you could have had a, a regular nine to five and nobody said that you have to come into this business and that you're going to live this high class, you know, middle class life. Uh, again, the actors and writers are saying, why should we work this hard in a business that is making gazillions of dollars, is bringing entertainment at home to viewers around the world? And we should have to scrape the bottom of the barrel and work three jobs and can't make it. Again, the other side is saying, well, you knew this was a hard business and nobody says that you're going to be the next Brad Pitt. How far apart are the two sides? I mean, 
And and I feel like someone's got to be somewhere underestimating the other side. The two sides really could not be farther apart. Um, that's what I'm hearing is there are no further discussions happening right now since both strikes began. But you're absolutely right. At a certain point, someone's going to have to cave in a bit, right? Something's got to give because at a certain point, one side is going to have to say enough is enough. Now, when I've been interviewing on picket lines and talking to the actors and the writers, they say we will be out here until the end of time. It's not going to be us. It's all on them. We have power in numbers. The studio side needs to come more to terms and come to the middle. Now, what will likely happen here is nobody's going to get exactly what they want. It's not going to be an exact meet in the middle, but there are likely going to be some deal points that there is some sort of compromise. But when you look at the actors on strike, and this is what many of them have told me, is yes, it's a huge uh, it's a huge risk and a huge undertaking that they're going on strike. And they realize how many people right now are out of work because of it. The crew members who aren't part of either union, they have also lost their jobs for the time being because of these strikes. But what a lot of these actors and writers are saying is we're not making enough money anyway. So we're willing to be out here every single day as long as we need because we're not making the money anyway. So that's their perspective. Now, the studio side, they their perspective is what the writers and actors are asking. The studio side, their perspective is what the writers and actors are asking for is not realistic and they're not going to give them everything that they want. So it's an interesting way to look at it. It's either those power in numbers and the writers and actors are on strike, which means that nothing in Hollywood can be produced. So maybe they have the lead. But then if you look at the other side, the studio side has all the money. So do they have more bargaining power? So it's interesting depending which way you look at it and who you're talking to. You brought up the streamers again. They have all been complaining that they are bleeding money. I'm like, oh, you know, I, I can't swallow that you're bleeding money when your CEO is making $25 million a year. How much does this sort of faux narrative, in my opinion, but okay, it's not necessarily a faux narrative. Do the actors and writers even care about? The actors and writers would agree with you 100%, Melissa, that this yeah. is a faux narrative. Um you know, they're saying exactly what you're saying, which is when you have one singular executive who's making over $100 million per year, when you can spend 50 to $100 million on one single production, and that's really the low end of it, actually, um, you know, how can you say that you can't pay us? Now, from the studio side, they're saying that after the pandemic, we have not fully recouped. Um, you know, we had a lot of losses with the the business being so impacted. The other thing is, is, you know, everybody wants to be Netflix and everybody has wanted to be Netflix for a while. So as we've seen over the past five or so years is every single one of these media companies has been in the race to have their own streamer, right? We have Peacock, we have now it's called Max. Uh, before though, Max was, uh, you know, a few different streaming services. So you really had this race to have your own successful streaming service. And what we're seeing now is that really didn't pay off. That's why there is this media consolidation. And Max is a good example. You know, instead of having, I think at one point it was, it was HBO H Max. HBO Max, even before that, it was HBO Go. And then there was Discovery Plus and, you know, now they're all all coming together. So the reality here is, is that all of these companies, the big parent companies, they pumped in a ton of money and a ton of resources into their streaming strategy. But a lot of those streaming strategies didn't work. So now they ended up losing a ton of money on those streaming strategies. So there is some truth when they say that we're bleeding money, but it's hard to say we're bleeding money while we're also paying someone $30 million per year. A friend of mine brought this up the other night, and I thought it was fascinating. Most of these conglomerates are publicly traded companies. Mm -hmm. The CEOs have a fiduciary duty to make the best deals for their shareholders. Mm -hmm. 
But the shareholders also want to watch TV. Right. Or go to the movies. Will, do, and I'm just guessing, do, will this become a pressure point in the next shareholders meetings? Are we going to, I mean, are we going to see pressure from your mom and pop investor? You know, I, I think you bring up an excellent point. At a certain point, they're going to ask, how is this going to impact the bottom line, right? Right. So we recently just had, uh, Netflix had their earnings call. And the head of Netflix, Ted Sarandos, um, by the way, definitely winning the CEO battle in the court of public opinion, right? Yes. You're thinking about Bob Iger, who is a pristine executive with an incredible track record, known to be an executive who really supports creatives, which is part of the reason why I think his comments were so surprising and so off brand for him. Uh, and now we have Ted Sarandos coming out saying, I am the son of a union worker. I remember my father being on strike. None of us want this strike. We hope to have a resolution. So you have the head of Netflix in their earnings call basically telling the business and telling all these people that invest in their business that we didn't want this either and that we are hoping that we come to a resolution soon. So I think you're absolutely right, Melissa, that at a certain point, everybody is going to be asking how much longer can this go on for, whether it's viewers at home who are waiting for the next season of Stranger Things or whether it is investors saying this is starting to impact the business. Again, you know, when you are spending $600,000 per week just to keep a production up and running where the cameras aren't rolling and there's nobody on that set, that's a substantial amount of money that they are taking a loss on. When you're not creating any new content, you know, is that eventually going to impact subscriber growth? As of now, we haven't seen that, at least from the numbers being reported. But if this goes on for months and months on end, do people stop paying for their net? Like subscription because they feel like they have watched everything in the library. Uh, you know, with the broadcast networks, does it impact advertising if there's not new content? But again, that's why the broadcast networks are really loading up on reality content, reality TV. And the streamers are, of course, better positioned during this time than the broadcast networks because they do have this library of content. So even though people are waiting for a new season to come out of their new show, there's still all this new content to discover and they may discover new shows. You know, maybe we see some new hits come out during this uh, during this time, during the strikes, that is a show that's five years old, but everybody just discovers it. We may see that happen as well. A lot of very popular shows now come out of Europe, the English speaking countries specifically. From Okay, and you're going to have to explain this to me because the movie Wicked was shooting in Europe. They had to shut down. House of the Dragon did not. I couldn't, I read a ton about it, but I could not understand this. So please explain to me why all the actors, all the British actors can keep working and none of the Americans can keep working even though they're working on something that's being filmed in Europe. Okay, this is a great question. So the easiest way to answer is that actors overseas are often in different unions. So SAG-AFTRA and the WGA is our unions here in America, but overseas, there's a different union, and that union is not on strike. So House of the Dragon, all of those actors... I shouldn't say all because I don't know 100%, but clearly the far majority of those actors are in another union, which is not SAG, so they're able to keep working. On Wicked, the far majority of those actors are SAG, so they had to shut down. And it's the same with the writers. If the writers overseas are in another union that's an overseas union, they can keep working. That's why when the writer strike began before the actors went on strike, a lot of people were saying it'll be interesting to see how production is impacted overseas. Are they all of a sudden, you know, are our, our major studios going to try to be shooting overseas and bring in non-WGA writers and not SAG actors? But that's very difficult to do. Uh, and also all of these unions overseas they have released public statements saying that they stand with their fellow actors in SAG and they stand with their fellow writers in the WGA. So that is the easiest way to explain. They're just in a different union. And also when you've seen or, or read about 
some shows even in America that have continued in production. Well, now they can't because of the actor strike. So now everything is shut down aside from independent films, essentially, uh, and independent productions. But when just the writers were on strike, some shows were able to continue operating because these productions insisted that all the writing was done on the show and that they weren't doing any rewrites. And why that has caused a lot of flack is because anybody who works in the business knows that what's on paper, the script there, you don't just finish a script in the writer's room and say, here's your script, have fun on set, see you when it comes out in the movies. What happens is those writers on set or producer writers who are saying, oh, this line doesn't work. You know, now that I'm seeing someone standing on set, this line isn't working, let's tweak it. They're not allowed to do that. So I just went on a tangent and I know that's not what you're asking, Melissa, but I also thought that that was interesting. You know, why could some shows continue? Why could others not? But now it's much easier to understand because everything is shut down at this point here in America now. Okay, back to Europe for a second. And I'm thinking it just a show like um, Succession popped into my head. You have actors that are members of both unions. Right. Which union takes precedence? So I, and I'm specifically thinking about Succession. Right. Where the majority of the cast yeah. were not American. Mm-hmm. So you know that they were mem- they're members of their home country union. Who takes precedence? Well, they're also all members of SAC. That's what I'm saying is it's... Right. So that would be the difference. Where House of the Dragon, it's all British actors who are all members of their their union overseas and it's an overseas production whereas something like wicked let's bring up not every actor is part of that overseas union so they can't be in production for with wicked uh i'm assuming that ariana grande is a member of sag and is not a member of the other union in the uk so ariana grande immediately has to leave sag So even if there's other actors there who are part of both unions, the actors who are only part of SAG have to leave. So then it becomes a question of, and I'm assuming it's not just Ariana Grande, right? There's a lot of actors on the production of Wicked who are just members of SAG. So the question is, is do you take them out and do you recast them with a British actor? And do you rewrite the whole script without their character? You know, do you rewrite it so that there's scenes that don't include them and you keep going? And you see how that becomes very, very complicated, particularly when one or more of those actors is the star. So perhaps there could be a scenario where you have a show where 99% of the actors are in another union overseas and there's one actor who's SAG and maybe they say we're going to recast that person. Um, We haven't seen that, that yet, but feasibly, I suppose that could happen. And I'm assuming that a lot of actors, and I don't know why this one popped into my head, Helen Mirren is a member of both. So who d- does is does it take depending upon where the production is based that union takes precedence? Yes, and it's also what union is supporting that production. So all of these actors have contracts that they are supported on set. So if you're on set in in Los Angeles on a SAG production and let's say you show up to work one day and there's bad behavior, right? You feel like you're being mistreated. You can actually call up your union rep and say, you know, X, Y, and Z happened to me. What are the guidelines? Where is my protection? Or I didn't get a paycheck. I'm going to call my union rep and and say that. Um, So that's how the union works. So I don't think it's necessarily which one takes precedent. I think the reason why some shows are being shut down and others aren't is because, again, if you even have one actor who's not a member of that overseas union, then the show can't go on because they are not protected under that set and under the guidelines of that set. I mean, Wicked being shut down certainly made for great celebrities looking awesome fashion-wise at Wimbledon. Yeah. Not yeah. to not to be completely shallow. No, it's we're all <laughs> the fashion too, Melissa. And I have to tell you, I... I saw something that I thought was so funny, not to be shallow, but, you know, we have to find some levity in some of these things. You know, Margot Robbie on this press tour for Barbie has just like phenomenal, right? Every single look is better than the next. 
And I saw a tweet the day that the strike started that somebody said, you know, Margot Robbie was spotted like in sweats and Birkenstocks and she's now free. (laughs) (laughs) So in your in your educated guess. How long is this going to last? I think this is going to go on for a while. I do not see that there's any resolution anytime soon. I think when there has to be some movement is when these companies quite literally run out of content and run out of something to put on the air or to release in theaters. And yes, while we have these production shutdowns and that is costing, will cost tens of millions of dollars to shut these things down. And we're going to see a lot of impact with release dates being pushed, right? If you have a movie that's dated for 2024 and it's in production now, and now it's shut down, maybe it doesn't get released till 2025. So there will be a lot of impact. But the real impact is when do they quite literally run out of content to put on the air? And we already spoke about this, but the streamers are much better positioned than a broadcast network. Because a broadcast network for fall, they're already having to be strategic and kind of shifting all these puzzle pieces to make their schedules work for the fall. Again, a lot of reality, some reruns, uh, you know, taking some some productions uh, from maybe one of their partners under the same parent company and putting that on their hair. But if these companies are now tasked with doing this again in January, right, and not just for September with those fall seasons, that's going to be troublesome. So I can't really answer your question for the specific time frame, but I think it could be months until this goes on. Elizabeth, thank you so much. You really did help make sense of this in sort of the cliff notes way. So our big takeaways are actors and writers want more money. Producers are saying we're being generous enough. Go fuck yourselves. And nobody's going to be shooting anything. And it's going to be a lot of reality TV. That's the best summation that I have heard. (laughs) You know what? Just sometimes you just gotta boil it down. And it sounds so good coming out of your mouth, especially. (laughs) Elizabeth, thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa.